Oh, there I am. Welcome to the David Dunlap Observatory in Richmond Hill, Ontario. This facility is run by the Royal Astronomical Society of Canada. What we have here is a telescope with a mirror that is 1.88 meters large. It's housed at the back of the telescope. So the light coming in through the observatory dome reflects off that large primary mirror towards that little mirror up there. We call it the secondary mirror. The light then reflects off that secondary mirror back towards the primary mirror. And there's actually a hole in the center of that mirror that allows the light to be focused either at a CCD, where we can take a picture and look at it on a computer screen, or as we have now, an eyepiece that we can look through. Now, this telescope is 75 years old. When it was first opened, it was the second largest telescope in the entire world. And much of the control system that was used back in those days is still in place today. Now keep in mind, this is a, a 23 ton telescope, and yet we can move it uh, by hand with this crank uh, due to the incredible balance of the telescope. Now as you can well imagine, the dome itself would have to move as well to uh, uh, compensate for the movement of uh, the object in the night sky. This is the telescope we use at UOIT in the Introduction to Astronomy program. Now don't let its small size fool you. Uh, this telescope works perfectly well for our purposes. Essentially what happens is I take the astronomy class out into a field at UOIT. We look through the telescope and we're able to see such great features as the, the craters on the moon in high detail and the Galilean moons of Jupiter. For most of these students, it's the very first time that they're even looking through a telescope. The, they'll have that reaction where they, they'll look through like back and forth and like, that little dot I'm looking at is Saturn. This is my fourth year undergraduate student, uh, Jessica. And so her specific project that we um, chose together was for her to grow a black hole inside of a dark matter galaxy. Yeah. These aren't stars, right? Like, no, 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 they're not stars. It's just within matter them. within the galaxy. Okay, so this is this represents the dark matter, right? Yes. And then, so you're putting a black hole right in the center of this. Yes. Let's see what happens. There definitely is uh, a gender divide in in the sciences, in the mathematics, and it's actually interesting. I was looking at some of the um, standardized tests that Ontario conducts. This was for grade six students specifically, and, and I was trying to get to the bottom of, of this problem. Where does it occur where uh, young ladies somehow feel that they are not as good or they're not as interested in these uh, topics? So this is what happened. In the grade six standardized test for mathematics, uh, young ladies performed better than young men did. However, they also asked the question something along the lines of, um, do you think you are good at math? Something like two-thirds of the boys said that they thought they were good at math, but only a third of the girls did. And yet the girls did better than the boys. And I'm trying to think to myself, uh, how does one explain that? And you can see it's all getting pulled into yeah, this black yeah. hole. But then around now, it explodes. Oh boy, yeah. So oh all the particles gosh. get kicked out again. But one thing that I'm certain is going to help is the increased number of um, uh, young ladies going into teaching the sciences. Uh, at UOIT, we have a very strong uh, concurrent education program where students enter a five-year program where four years they'll do uh, a bachelor's of science and then one year they do an education degree and then and become a, um, a science teacher. So hopefully, um, yeah. by young uh, girls seeing role models and seeing people teaching the hard sciences and the mathematics that they will not be intimidated, not lose interest, not think that they're not every bit as good as um, their, their male counterparts.
So uh, fitness wise, weekly I'll attend a yoga class, I go to my swimming lessons, and I'd say I'm in the, the gym lifting weights and doing cardio between three and five days a week, depending on how much time I have. But uh, I, I do honestly think that physical fitness is a really important part, not just, you know, uh, of everybody's lives, but specifically for people who make a living out of using their brains, specifically academics. I used to have a, a sensei back when I was a kid for Taekwondo, and he used to say, sound of body, sound of mind. And essentially one thing and the other go together. And, and I firmly believe that. Um, I think it's really important to, to maintain that balanced um, fitness lifestyle. So something that not all my students know about me was that I was in the original X-Men movie. First, let's put this in context. Uh, as a person who, who commonly read comic books growing up, X-Men was always my favorite as, as a youngster. And uh, when I heard they were not only filming an X-Men movie, but filming it in Toronto, I was like, I am going to be in that movie. There I am. For me, working on the X-Men uh, showed me a little bit about the monotony of uh, big budget productions. The fact that when you have a hundred million dollars to make uh, something, you can make it perfect. And uh, it was seeing the, the take after take after take and essentially just slightly shifting uh, a camera or, or, or changing the lights here or delivering a line with just a slight different uh, uh, emphasis on a word um, and, and you know, seeing that for, for, for 12 hours for two nights, um, I think at the end of that 24 hours of shooting, it probably translated to, I'd say 45 seconds in the movie. Oh, there I am. I was thinking about the actors in a theater production and how they do the same lines every day. And they, I mean, they must change things slightly. The nuances are small. But, but essentially, I have to uh, give 26 two-hour performances for a single class, each one different than the other. And, and then if my teaching load is up to four classes, that, that can be like 100 uh, of these you know, small performances uh, in one semester. It, uh, it is like... A theater, but at the same time, it's it's a little more um, less rehearsed. I don't want to say it's improv or anything like that, because I mean I do prepare my lectures uh, ahead of time. But at the same time, you don't know exactly what you're going to say. Those are the best lectures when you know the content of what you want to teach the students, but you don't prepare how you teach it to such a fine degree. It 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 has that immediacy. Um, where your passion for a certain subject can actually translate through to them.